Welcome to the Ridgefield Playhouse Diversity Film Series. I am your host, Cheryl Washington, of this bonus content. You just had the chance to see an amazing music documentary, Summer of Soul. Oh my goodness, we are going to party like it's 1969. All the great, beautiful, black, bodacious, and bold musicians that you saw in this documentary, Stevie Wonder. And we talked to uh, uh, Gladys Knight and the Pips, and we saw also Max Roach and, and Mahalia Jackson. And so many amazing artists. Today we're going to talk to someone who you have also seen in this production, and that's the Fifth Dimension. Florence LaRue is joining us. Florence LaRue is an amazing talent. She's a singer, a songwriter, a violinist, a dancer, an author, and also she is one incredible woman of faith. Please welcome Florence LaRue. Florence, I am so happy to see you. Look at you in your dazzling red outfit. From well, thank you. And, yeah, look at you. You look amazing. It is so wonderful seeing you. Florence, we know you as an original member of The Fifth Dimension, but you're also not just a singer. You're a songwriter. You're a dancer. You're a violinist. You're an author. And you're a <laughs> woman of faith, which I absolutely love. And it's so grand having you here with us with our Ridgefield Playhouse Diversity Film Series. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure to be here, Cheryl. And if, if I don't have my normal energy, it's just because I'm a little saddened because in the last six days, I've lost my, two of my best friends. Oh, but no. while I'm sad for their spouses, I am just, just praising that they're with the Lord. And I'm happy that we have music to just cheer us up and make us all happy. Well, I know you are indeed a woman of faith, and I really enjoyed talking uh, and reading your book this past weekend, talking about Second Acts. But we're going to talk first about, if you don't mind, this amazing music doc uh, documentary, because it was really like none other. It sat in the vault for so many years, a treasure cove of so many amazing talents, including yourself. And thank God for the Roots Quest Love for bringing this to our attention. It first premiered, of course, as we know, at Sundance uh, Festival, and it was just so well received. And now we got a chance to see it this evening. And I just wanted to ask you, first off, how was it that the Fifth Dimension was even approached to be at the Harlem Cultural Festival back in 1969? Well, actually, Cheryl, you know, when The Fifth Dimension first came out, people didn't know how to uh, categorize us, if we were R&B or if we were pop, and they coined the phrase Champagne Soul, which I really liked. And uh, we, we didn't sound what pe like what people expected a Black group to sound like. And our manager, uh, who happened to be my husband, and I had some inside information, he wanted the world to know just who we were. As a matter of fact, he wanted us to be like the Black Beatles. And um, so he thought, you know, we discussed it. And he said, this is a great chance for the world to see who the fifth dimension is and to be to represent uh, black music at this wonderful event. Uh, so he's the one that put it together for the fifth dimension to come and perform there. Well, I think that's amazing. And the, the fact that you were on stage with so many like thousands of people. They were in the trees. They oh, were. <laughs> wow. No violence. I mean, just wonderful music of all genres. Absolutely. And you know what was interesting about you and, and, and the group? Because when I watched you sing Aquarius Let the Sunshine In, there was such an amazing chemistry that took place that you were vibing with the audience. And you're, gra you're grabbing people. People are grabbing you. Y'all you know, look like, as someone said, y'all look, look like y'all were in a creamsicle. Your outfits. <laughs> Who came up with that, that design for that outfit? Well, we used to have a, a, a designer, Boyd Kloppen, designed our outfits, and we would choose our outfits by whether they were casual or formal, and depending on the weather. Matter of fact, it was so hot, you notice I took off my vest. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, 
the fact that you were, and you call yourself Champagne Soul, which I kind of love as well, is that since you just said the same thing, the fact that you were in Harlem, and this was the first time the Fifth Dimension had ever performed there, was it intimidating at first? Because, you know, Harlemites, they're going to let you know who they are. You know, Cheryl, it was not intimidating at all. As a matter of fact, this is the first time we really performed for a black audience because of our music. People thought we were a white group and our audiences were 99.9% .9 white. But we weren't intimidated because there was such love there. As I said before, no violence, not one incident. And we were just received as they, they loved the Stone Soul picnic. People were out there dancing to that. It was great. Beyond our, we were just accept it beyond our expectations. Beyond your expectations. That's so cool. Now, because... You know, think about being uh, accepted. If you want to know the truth, it was, it was another audience for us. That's true. That yeah. is very true. Because you were able to galvanize that spirit that may not have been able to manifest it prior to you hitting that stage. But once you did, you all rocked the house. <laughs> you rocked the house like nobody's business. So Thank when you were up there, did you feel that energy that was oh, yeah. uh, transparent? Oh yes, we feel it. Uh, to this day, that's one of the things I love about being with the Fifth Dimension. We feel the audience's energy. And we still, we get people, whenever it's, um, uh, possible. We get people up on stage to party with us, sometimes because of um, security, you know, you're not always allowed to do that, but it's, it's really fun. I really enjoy uh, connecting with the people. When I first got with the group, you know, I'm very nearsighted, so when I first got with the group, I couldn't see the audience, and I loved it because I was very shy, but I got contact lenses, and when I start seeing the audience, it was a whole different way of performing because I could communicate with people, and I love that. I love that too. I mean, just watching all of you up there, you know, it was very interesting because something that was said in the documentary itself was that it was important for you to be recognized and, and, and inspired by the audience that was there. Uh, and I'm just wondering because of the fact that, that, you know, you had been around for so long, you had all these hit records, you know, platinum, gold, et cetera. And even though the audience may not have been as familiar with you, you know, it, I don't know if it was very difficult to be able to appeal to them in a way that they embraced you, but was it that important for you to be able to win their satisfaction? Oh, yes. Not only as black people, but as an audience, it's always important to win the satisfaction of the audience. That's what we're there for. We're there to, to entertain, but also to make people feel something. We, and that this was during the time of uh, this, this difficult time politically, you know, but we, and we wanted people to forget their problems for a while and to just come together and experience some music that made them feel good. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I'm glad you brought that up because this really was the aftermath of so many things that had transpired, MLK's uh, assassination, RFK, right. JFK, et cetera, and, and at the height of the civil rights movement, if you will. Did that factor into the way you intended to win your audience over or in the way that you intended to perform? Was there any kind of difference that, that had sh been shown because of that, that, that kind of eclipsed the whole scenario of the civil rights era? Well, you know, Cheryl, we don't, when we perform, we don't want people to forget what's going on in the world, but we want to give them hope that things are going to get better. That's one of the main reasons we recorded um, Aquarius, because it speaks of harmony and people coming together, people of all ages, all races. Uh, that's the reason that we perform, is to bring them all together. We've been you, go ahead. I'm sorry. I missed what you said. I apologize. Be inclusive. To be inclusive. Did yeah. you see any white people there? I know there you were, said you were. <laughs> there were a couple. Oh yeah, <laughs> because you know they called this uh, the Black Woodstock, and because Woodstock had occurred, and because also this volume had been in a vault for so long, it had been untouched, undiscovered, and 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 um, and because the fact that that the publicity factor did not generate the way you might have felt because of the whole. A Woodstock scenario, did that play any role in how you perceived um, the the genre of music? Did, did that have, have any factor at all? I mean, you it was almost as though, and I don't want to put it in a, in a pejorative factor, but did it appear as though it might have been uh, an afterthought, that you all were an afterthought, this, this, this uh, Harlem Cultural Festival, because the Woodstock folks had gotten so much attention, so much publicity? Did you ever feel that way? 
I think so. As a matter of fact, you know, Sly Stone went from the Harlem Festival to Woodstock. Oh, did he? Yes. Wow, I didn't even know that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and watching Sly Stone perform up there, because to me, he brought something that really did speak to black folks in particular. But between Sly Stone, Nina Simone singing to be young, gifted, and black, that to me was more than just music. It was a message. How did you feel about that? It was was definitely a message. And you know, um, as, as, uh, what what can I say? As hippie as, as Sly Stone was, his sister Rose, years later, was the uh, leader of the gospel choir in my church. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> yes. Now, is that a variety of music? That certainly is. And speaking of music, because there were so many different genres that we're talking about with this this magnificent piece of, of a documentary, you're talking about blues, jazz, pop, soul, uh, salsa. I mean, everything imaginable. Yes. Uh, when you got there, were there any particular, because I mean, it was so star-studded. I mean, you talk about Stevie Wonder, there, I mean, everybody there, Gladys I, who, was there anyone that you were drawn to that, did you have any any um, uh, fangirling that you wanted to do or, th- or did you all do that? I tell you, the one person that I would like to have met was Mahalia Jackson. Oh. But unfortunately, we were on tour, so we didn't get to really uh, meet a lot of the people that were on the show because we would do our our portion of the show, and then we had to leave to go to the next engagement. However, years later, we became friends with most of them, B.B. King, Stevie, Gladys. We all became friends later. Wow. On the day that you performed, who else was on the roster? Oh, um, 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 I know I know who it was. Uh, Max Roach oh. and uh, the Edwin Hawkins singers. Oh, oh happy day. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, I mean, they were wearing those robes as hot as it was. And I don't even know how you weren't sweating. Well, we were. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, I don't know what the temperature was on that day, but it seemed like it, it was, was a It was hot. That's why I took off my vest. <laughs> right. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So now let me ask you also, because um, the fact that this was a party atmosphere, it really did send something that was inspiring to not just something that seemed like it was a cool thing to do. It was like a groovy kind of thing, but it, did, did it serve as some kind of inspiration to you and to the other members of, of uh, the fifth dimension? Most certainly the most of all, you know, I don't care what you do, you want to be accepted. And we felt accepted by our people. And that makes a big, that makes you really feel good. Exactly. So when you heard about the fact that this, documentary was going to hit the fact that it had laid dormant for so long and then you learned that oh my gosh it's going to, it's going to really become something mm-hmm. what was your first reaction did you think that it had just been buried anyway and it would never again be seen what was your reaction when you learned that this was going to take place when summer soul was actually going to evolve my first reaction was what took so long yeah yeah, yeah. What took so but it was long. wonderful to see some of these people at the beginning of their career, like Stevie was only 19. So it was great to see him grow and continue to write such wonderful music. Do you think anything like this could ever happen again? I mean, to have a kind of festival like this, I mean, well, obviously we're in a COVID environment mm-hmm. now, but you know, the fact that this was done, can uh, you imagine 50 years ago? I mean, I what do you I, think I, of? You know what? Sure. I, I can't imagine that happening today, unfortunately. Can you tell me why? Because well, I, think, think it's, I think people are more violent today. Wow. I, I, I would like to say, yes, music can bring us together, and I know it can, but it would be, I really believe it would be more difficult. Because I was going to say, I mean, music has such a way of healing. Yes. And the music that yes. you all sang, that was totally, you know, music that, that healed the soul. And all the songs you, that you sang. Back there, the whole feeling was like a flower child, uh, for flower children. You know, mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. people had hope and they wanted to be happy. Now there's so much going on and with the pandemic. A lot of people don't have hope. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to take more than music. It's also going to take faith. And I don't know what else to bring people together like that. Well, you are a woman of faith. So I'm just wondering how you might be able to turn that around. Do you have any any optimism? Or any recipes? I'm sorry. 
Lots of prayer. Lots of prayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but but there's got to be some kind of recipe that would inspire people to be able to to make that change. Almost sound like Michael Jackson, make that change. I just thought about that as I said it. I think just trying to be as positive, trying to be a good example, and teaching the young people. See, a lot of the young people uh, don't have hope because their parents don't, and their parents uh, don't teach them the faith. I don't care what religion you are. It's not about being religious. It's about being spiritual. It's about caring for, about other people. And the young people today, they don't have hope, and that's why one of the reasons there's so much violence. The families you know, are separated. You know, and uh, we we really need to we really need a, a faith foundation, no matter what faith you are. Well, what's interesting about you that I obviously read about is your second act, because not only do people know you as being a singer songwriter, and I gave you a litany of all the things that you've done, and I'm sure there's so much more than that. But the fact that you wrote, ah, <laughs> there's the book, there's the plug. <laughs> okay, that's Grace in your second act, a guide to aging gracefully. Now, I read that, is it true that your birthday is, is in February? In four days, I will be 80 years old. You better stop. You better stop. There's no way that you've been on this planet for eight decades. God's been good. God's been good. So I've got to ask you to what do you attribute your beauty, your ability to still stay forward and to still have the grace and dignity that I can see that's, that's in your, that's in your aura. Thank you, Cheryl. I think a lot of it is attitude and uh, with me, it's a foundation of faith. You know, I'm no angel. I've been through a lot in my life. People say, oh, Fifth Dimension. They have no idea some of the things I've been through. One of the, these days I may write that book. But um, I had that foundation. God's been with me. He's had my back in some situations where I should be either dead or in jail. Wow. Yes. I don't think anybody would ever expect that coming from Florence LaRue. I don't. Yeah. You're being very transparent. So maybe there needs to be a second book, a follow-up yes. to what you've written. Could could you give us some insight into the what the book is about? I mean, we do we talk about second X and, and it's about aging gracefully, but mentally, physically, and spiritually. You need all three. You know, when you're young, you you, you don't realize. Oh, one day I'm going to be eighty. I I'll never forget the day I looked in the mirror and I said, "You're not a girl anymore. You're a woman." <laughs> that was kind of scary. <laughs> and I, you look like your mother. <laughs> which is not bad. I'm sure that's but, a nice compliment. Uh, but you need both. When you're young, you know, you're you're enjoying life and you don't think about the future as much. I want young people, even though this is called Grace in Your Second Act and, was, and I had seniors in mind, male and female, hmm. I also want young people to prepare for their second act. Take care of your bodies, you know, um, eat well, exercise. And um, and also I want the seniors to know it's never too late. I started doing marathons in my 60s. I read that. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's it's never too late to start. You're still running? Oh, I don't run. I walked it. You walk. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Like a well, I, walk, I have two hip replacements, one knee replacement, and I walk at least a mile every day except Sunday. Okay. Oh, I guess that's for church or something. Uh, that's move yeah. it, move <laughs> it or lose it. <laughs> The juxtaposition that you just mentioned between the seniors and the young people, that's very interesting that you would combine the two in your book. How important was that to have that sense of, of priority? It's very important because when I was younger, uh, I was very active in sports. I played varsity basketball, ran track, uh, field hockey, and I could eat anything. Didn't gain a pound. Now I can't even get my thigh into the pants that I used to wear on stage. <laughs> but um, And I realized had I taken better care of myself when I was younger, I would be even healthier now. I was, wasn't sick. But, um, for instance, I was addicted to sugar. I couldn't eat a jelly bean, Cheryl. I had to eat the bag. <laughs> and uh, as I grew older, I learned that you know sugar is not good for you. You know, so if you if you take care of yourself when you're younger, science has us living to be older. But why not live older and healthier at the same time? Absolutely right. I'm looking at your backdrop and I see uh, it must be a platinum album there. Can you just oh, yes. <laughs> give us a thumbnail sketch of what's behind you, please? Oh, uh, this one is the Age of Aquarius album. Yes. <laughs> okay. we're, we're blessed to have 14 gold, um, let's see, four platinum. And then I also have some other. 
Um, I, you know, I have a, a degree, a bachelor's degree in education for teaching um, and several other uh, wonderful th- awards that I've been awarded on the wall. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, so then, wait, you said you have an, a, you got a BA in teaching education? Yes. Have yes. you ever considered teaching? Well, when I was younger, I wanted sense. to do two things. I wanted to teach and I wanted to be in the movies. And my mother said, get your education so you have something to fall back on. Well, let me tell you, you don't fall back on teaching. I get on my, you know, my bandwagon when you talk about that. Teachers are underpaid, not respected. It's a very important thing to do. But um, I, of course, got with the fifth dimension. So after I finished my student teaching, I went right into performing. That's fantastic. Are you still in touch with the other original members of the fifth dimension? We're in touch, uh uh-huh. How's everybody doing? Everyone's doing well? Unfortunately, Lamont McLemore is not doing real well health wise, but we you know we, we talk on the phone and Marilyn and Billy are still active. Ron Townsend passed away some real yes. yes. Are you because I know that you're still touring with another company of the uh manifestation of the, the yes. Yes. So how's that how's that going for you? Has, has the um pandemic slowed that down in terms of your yeah. touring? For two years we didn't work. Uh, we had sold out engagements that were, they didn't cancel them. They pushed them into the next year. So we'll be performing again uh, March 3rd on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then where will you go from there? Do you have um, a list of places in case oh, people yeah. are interested? You can go to the fifth dimension.com and uh, see, see where we're playing. I know we'll be at Niagara Falls. I'm looking forward to that. We were supposed to be there um I think it was about a, a week ago or so, but I'm glad we're going to be there in the warm weather because the falls are beautiful. <laughs> you said you're turning 80 in four more days. Four so more how days. do you think you're going to spend your 80th birthday? Probably a quiet dinner with friends. Not a lot of friends, just a couple. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the, but, but, but. We're going to have a disco party. Oh, my. <laughs> we're not going to do it now because of the pandemic, but we're, we're planning sometimes soon We're going, when the uh, pandemic is you know less. We're going to have a disco party. A disco party. Listen, I, I believe that you have a really healthy, amazing life. I mean, I can just see the energy in your face. <laughs> it just seems as though you enjoy life to the fullest every single day and that you I embrace try it. to live, Cheryl, and not exist. That's a good way of putting it. Good way of putting it. Florence, we're so delighted to have had you join us today with our Richfield Playhouse Diversity Film Series. Summer Soul is such a great, fantastic music documentary. I'm so proud that you were part of it. And I know Are we going to see you August 5th, Cheryl? Say it again, please. Are we going to see you August 5th? Oh, oh, I'll be there. Right. <laughs> you you come backstage so I can never know that you're there. <laughs> okay, I will be there. That's right, because you're going to be in Richfield. That's right, exactly. That's, right. That's, a, that's a nice plug that you've just given. Okay, listen, we're going to make certain that we are there, and we want to be able to talk to you again, perhaps, just yes. to give us a little bit more of a promotion, if you don't mind. That would be lovely. Florence LaRue, what a pleasure it is to speak with you. And I have to tell you one more thing because, you know, your book does talk a lot about beauty and and keeping yourself healthy in the second act. I was talking to a friend of mine just yesterday and I said, I'm going to have the pleasure of interviewing Florence LaRue tomorrow. And my friend said, please tell her how beautiful I think she is. Oh, thank and so I'm I'm saying that to you, and not because it, it's something that I I was paid to say, <laughs> but because it was genuine. This person said it in very genuine, authentic terms. I just want you to know that, and thank you're beautiful. You I can tell my friend that you're beautiful both outside and inside. Thank you. God bless you. Such a pleasure having you. God bless you as well. Thank you so much, Florence, for joining us today with the Richfield Playhouse Diversity Film Series. All the best to you. We'll see you back here in August. August 5th is the exact date. Okay, be there, be square. (laughs) And I want to thank Florence LaRue, of course, for being with us today. And I also want to thank the Aquarian Water Company for sponsoring the Richfield Playhouse Diversity Film Series. It's always a blast talking to people about the wonderful movies and documentaries that we are showing as part of this series. Thank you again. I'm Cheryl Washington. I will see you next time.